over the last few weeks, we've been talking about how we know what we know and why it's important. Now, uh, generally speaking, it's much easier to work out how we know what we know, and it's a much harder question to answer why it's important. But in a community like ours, we want to take that next step. We want to get beyond knowledge. We want the free dissemination of knowledge. We want that to happen. We want that to happen without fear or defensiveness. But beyond that, we want to get beyond that and we want to ask the harder, the deeper questions, the complex questions about why it matters. Why does knowledge matter? What do we want to do with it? Why are we here? And all those good questions. We have no tradition telling us what we have to do or think or how we need to express ourselves. We're completely free. We're free to craft our own way of being in the world and as a group. And that's both scary and exciting at the same time. Feel them both. Feel the fear. Maybe some of you wish that there was more certainty. Maybe some of you wish you had someone who could just tell you what to think. Feel that fear of being completely a free spirit. And at the same time, feel the excitement. We are engaged here in an incredible experiment. I don't mind calling it that. I don't think we should be ashamed of calling this an experiment. There's no template for this. We're doing what we're doing and we're working this out as we're going. So feel the excitement of that. Feel the humility of that. We don't have all the answers. We'll make mistakes along the way. And feel the gratitude to be part of a group of people who will allow you to take risks and try things. Now here's the thing. I trust you so much that I don't feel any need to protect you. So let me tell you something about myself. I am an atheist. Let me pause at that point and let that just sink in for you a little bit. I don't need applause for it. I'm not proud of it. It's not a matter of pride. It's just a reality that for probably 20 years now, I have been an atheist. Unambiguously. Not conflicted about it. I don't wish there was a God. I feel completely at ease with being an atheist and have for decades. And it feels quite good to say it, to be honest. I don't expect that all of you feel the same way as me. That's all right. But you need to understand the liberation to stand in front of a group and tell the truth about the way I feel and not feel the need to protect your feelings or protect your sense of security. You see, I trust you too much for that. Let me just lighten it up at this point because it feels a little heavy to kind of <laughs> drop that, just drop that around the room. Right now it's hanging. So uh, how many of you watch the, the American sitcom, sitcom Everybody Loves Raymond? You, you all know that show. So early on in the series, there's a great scene. I watched this a few weeks ago and I thought, I love this little line. I, I went straight away and wrote it down. So it's the classic family sitcom. Raymond is the son. The mother loves Raymond. He can't do anything wrong. Everybody loves Raymond. There's the brother. It's always put upon and nothing ever goes well for the brother. And then there's the super controlling mother. So Raymond is having a situation in his family where he's threatening to tell his oldest daughter that Santa Claus is not real. There's a lot of family conversation about this. And then the controlling mother, Marie, she comes in and she is just desperate about this. And she says, my own son, an atheist. <laughs> Don't you love that? I thought that was such a brilliant line, I immediately had to write that down. My own son, an atheist. Now maybe some of you feel that way this morning. My own minister, an atheist. (laughs) 
Well, the good news was that Raymond's son, was, the Raymond's daughter was never told about Santa Claus, at least not at that time. Family harmony was kept intact. I feel no need to protect you. I trust you. I trust you to disagree with me. I trust you to form your own ideas. I trust you to craft your own spiritual path and to use me as a bouncing off point. If I can provoke you to think in some new way or to ask some new questions, then my job is done. Now, one of the problems that I have with liberal progressive religion is that it dwells so much in ambiguity, in a haze of ambiguity, a bit like the haze that I left hovering over this group a little while ago, that you never know really where you stand. And yet the underlying undercurrent is that people feel the need to be protected. And the ambiguity serves as padding. Now, the, the British comedian Ricky Gervais has a great coming out story. Coming out as an atheist, that is. Happened for him when he was eight years old. He grew up in a classic working class family, as he tells the story. And for him, his mother got him involved in Sunday school. And the way he describes it, Jesus was like free babysitting for his mother. Because if she couldn't be there, as a working class single mom, if she couldn't be there, then Jesus would be watching. So Jesus became free babysitting. Anyway, the mother had Ricky doing all sorts of activities out of a Christian workbook. So Ricky was very familiar with Jesus and with the idea of God. And one day his older brother, 18-year-old brother, came home, saw Ricky and said, what are you doing? And Ricky said, I'm doing my, my Jesus book, my Jesus coloring book. And his older brother started to say, well, hang on, there's no such thing as... And the mother interrupted him and said, Bob, no more. At that moment, Ricky Gervais knew that his mother was trying to protect him. And he knew at that moment that his brother must be telling the truth. In that moment, he said... Within an hour, he had become an atheist as an eight-year-old kid because of the body language in his family. If his mother felt the need to stop his brother from saying these words, this must be the truth. This must be something that he would explore. A bit like the reading this morning from Saul. Religion has played the role over the centuries in protecting people from knowledge, keeping people in the dark effectively. I don't feel any need to do that. You're all big enough to work things out for yourselves. So this morning I'm coming out. If you didn't know it before, it's not new for me, but if you didn't know it before, I am an atheist. But let me tell you something, out of, something else about myself. I'm an atheist who is fascinated by God. Now let that just hover over the group for a minute as well. I'm an atheist who is fascinated by God. Because all the things that people mean when they talk about God are all the things I'm fascinated in. And when people have an experience of what they call God, those are experiences that I have and that I love, that I cherish. They're the types of experiences that, that give me my experience of life as it is. So I'm an atheist who's fascinated by God. I just don't necessarily feel the need to use the word God to explain them or describe them. In fact, on the contrary, I often feel that using the word God is putting another veil of ambiguity around the experience. And I'm far more interested in all of us having direct experiences of life. I want us to live our lives like those people in Pentecostal churches who are lost in the moment, completely immersed in whatever they're experiencing before they put their language on it, before they overlay this experience with their interpretation, which they got from their pastor 
before all of that, just have the experience. Just immerse yourself in being you, being alive, being now. This is where the treasure in life is. Now, if you choose to call that God, I'm fine with that. I don't feel the need to, but if you feel the need to, if it gives you some greater sense of the sacred, then go for it. I've got no problem with that. But I want to open up the space for those who don't want to use that language. And I believe there are more of us here than maybe we've thought in the past. In fact, I believe there are more people like that in churches around the world than we've ever given credence to. I'm interested in opening up that space, removing the haze of of ambiguous protection from around people and trusting people just to have that experience of life without the language. Let the language come later. Now, I'm excited about this. To me, this is... This gets us to to where we can take the best of both worlds. Where we can have that passionate engagement with life and at the same time hold on to our critical faculties. Now there's a theory. Nigel Barber is the author who has a theory that by 2038, the world as a whole will tip over to the point where there are a majority atheists in the world. The reason he has this argument is because he says by 2004, the world's top, in terms of economic development, the world's top 10 countries had all tipped into that point of being majority atheists. So he's equating economic development with the willingness to let go of what in the past may have been false securities, false certainties and instead become responsible for our own lives, for our own futures. So according to his theory, it's already happened for the world's top 10 economies by 2004, and it will happen for the whole world by 2038. Now, I don't know, do you agree with that? I don't know if I agree with the numbers. I think he may be a little ambitious about 2038, but he's definitely heading in the right direction. The world is definitely heading towards either atheism or what's called none, which is another word for spiritual but not religious, passionate outside of tradition, whatever words, whatever phrases you want to use for that. The world seems to be moving in that direction, Europe a lot further on than America, but according to the New York Times today, America also heading in that same direction. So what does that mean for a community like ours? Does it mean you have to become atheists? It means it's all right to be an atheist. It means that if you've been a closeted atheist for a long time, it's all right to come out. It means that if you have a passionate experience of life but choose not to use religious language, that's okay. It means that in some senses we model what the future might be for community outside of tradition. That's the beautiful experiment of who we are. You see, we can take the best, not just of the Episcopalian free-thinking church, we can take the best of the Enlightenment. We can take the best of science. We can get all excited about the Higgs boson and enjoy discovery, enjoy new thought. We can take all the best of the enlightenment and we can be the type of community that asks, why is this important? What do we want to do with this information? Why are we here? What difference do we want to make in the world? We can take the best from both worlds. Let me read you a short quote from Jonathan Haidt. I know that a number of you are reading his books at the moment. He describes his work as positive psychology. Now, positive psychology is not just about being positive. It's far more in-depth than that. It's about well-being. It's about well-being as individuals and as communities. And I think it's a fair phrase to describe our community. We're a positive psychology community. We're interested in well-being. But this is what Jonathan Haidt said. He said, I'm an atheist. 
I don't believe that gods actually exist, but I part company with the new atheists because I believe that religion is an adaptation that generally works quite well to suppress selfishness, to create moral communities, to help people work together, <coughs> trust each other, and collaborate towards common ends. Now, aren't those worthy aims? This is why I now say that even though I'm an atheist, I have a lot of respect for religion. And even though I'm an enlightened mentor, I have a lot of respect for critiques of the Enlightenment that point out all of the good things that were thrown out by the Enlightenment. So there's an interesting perspective as it intersects with our community. I've given you a lot this morning, haven't I? So let me just kind of end this, bring it together with a short story. And again, invite you to think for yourselves, to decide what makes sense for you, what language makes sense for you, and to trust each other. Now, this is a story. I used to believe it was real. I now believe it's a parable. Either way, it doesn't really matter. It's a great story. It's a story about the Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, first man in space. So having been out in space, he came home, everyone wanted to talk to him. Everyone wanted to hear from this man about what he'd seen in space. So first of all, he's called to a meeting with the Russian president at the time, Khrushchev. And in this meeting, Khrushchev says, so Yuri, you've been to outer space. You've seen out there beyond what anyone has ever seen. Now, please tell me that you saw no God and no heaven out there. Yuri, thinking quickly, said to him, Actually, I went to the outer space and I did see God and I did see the heavens. And Khrushchev said to him, You must tell no one that. That was the end of their conversation. Next, Yuri's called to another meeting, this time with the the head of the Russian Orthodox Church. The Archbishop called Yuri and said, tell me, you've been out of space. You've been out beyond what any of us have ever seen. Please tell me that you saw God and you saw the heavens out there. And he said, I'm sorry to tell you, there was no God and there was no heavens out there. And the Archbishop said to him, you must tell no one what you've learned. Now here's, see if I can bring this together for us. Here's where this comes together. You see, human progress, all wrapped up in the Enlightenment, wants to do away with imagination, wants to do away with poetry, wants to do away with even subjective experience that leads to so much morality. And then there's religion. It wants to keep people in the dark about the truth. And here's where we come as a community without needing to protect each other, without needing to hold back knowledge from you. We have an opportunity. The opportunity is that we can come together and take the best of both worlds without locking into one without doing away with science and without doing away with all the good that religion brings. We can take the best of both worlds, critique them both and take the best from them both. You can be both a rational, free-thinking, scientific explorer and you can be a person of imagination. You can be a person of love. You can be a person of morality can be a person that's part of a community where we come together and we're not held together by the glue of knowledge or lack of knowledge. We're held together by the glue of wanting to make a difference in the world and seeing this as one of the places we can do it. In the end, we're part of this community for the common good. If we grow as individuals along the way, that's the bonus. We're here in this community to make a difference in the world. 
and to do it together. And so from that place in me which loves to immerse myself in an impassionate embrace with the present moment, God by any name, I greet the same in you. Namaste.